One, two, one, two. You know how we do with your boy BQ. Welcome back to Power Moves, covering NWA Power. Brought to you by the Impact Lounge YouTube channel. So if it's your first time checking me out, I'm typically an Impact Wrestling guy, but I have so much interest in the NWA because I was a big fan of what Corgan was doing with TNA. And obviously they've got so many names that are familiar to the Impact Wrestling fan base that I just had to review it. And I wanted to diversify what I do with my own content, you know, because I'm so impact heavy. But, you know, I thought the NWA was a good, you know, a good compromise to do something different that would appeal to those who enjoy impact wrestling. So thanks for checking me out. And again, this is Power Move. So let's get right into this episode. I've really loved everything NWA is doing so far. You know, obviously their first episode was their their money maker that was the big one that was the one that had the most eyes on it and that was just their best episode as a whole in general it just it just was then the second one i wasn't as high on got really back on board last week and then this one was good too this one had a lot that i like and you know i think they're still feeling themselves out a little bit and i think you know once they take this set of tapings and look at the audience responses they're going to you know when they come back to tape for the next set I think they're going to make the necessary changes and adjustments. So this, as much as they're embodying old school wrestling here, there's still a little bit of one of my biggest issues with AEW, and it's it's who who are the heels and who are the baby faces, or is there just are we just blurring the lines now with with it works with Dynamite, but like with Power, with what NWA is doing, it's. I feel like they would benefit more from clear cut heels. I can I get it with a guy like Nick Aldis. He's the champion and he's putting over he's putting everybody over verbally, not obviously not in the ring. Then you got Eli Drake, who's a guy who's always a clear cut heel his whole career, and then it's like he's you know, teaming with Tim Storm. They're blurring the lines a little bit. It doesn't bother me too much. Don't get me wrong. I just kind of wish I understood it a little bit better but they the first match we get of the evening well yeah let's not get into the match let me let's talk about first James Storm coming and the whole thing with Cabana where you know Cole Cabana is saying I'm the rifle champion I deserve a shot this whole thing I have to give props on the whole, you know, Nick Aldis coming out, Eli Drake. Eli Drake was more of like an instigator. He's almost being an instigator because he's trying to push James Storm to challenge for the championship. And I feel like I kind of get where that's going a little bit. Now. I almost feel like maybe he baited him into it because, you know, what what happened with this whole, you know, everyone going at Nick Aldis out there, Eli Drake's out there, James Storm's out there. Cole Cabana's out there, all these people, and they, they issued this challenge. And Nick Aldis comes up with the challenge. This is a six-way match. If my team wins, I'm going to get a couple partners, you get a couple partners. If my team wins, you have to put your title on the line against Cole Cabana. Now, if you win, you get your world title shot. Because, again, Eli Drake's trying to push him into, trying to bait him into challenge for the world title. And Eli Drake keeps saying, hey, that belt you have is the ticket to the world title. So he says if James Storm's team wins, he'll get his title match, but he has to surrender the championship, make it vacant. You want something, you got to put something on the line. So the first thing I got to say, which made this so amazing, was if you rem- God, if you remember back to Ultimate Warrior versus Hulk Hogan, And it was champion versus champion. This was unheard of back then. Unheard of. And regardless of what happened here, the Intercontinental Champion was was going to be, championship was going to be vacant. Because if the Warrior lost, his title was going to be vacant at that point. You know, his title wasn't, it's, I I believe, you know, because both titles were on the line, technically. Because you got to give up something. 
and uh like modern day world world wrestling entertainment the champions fight each other all the time now i say this as someone who hasn't watched in a few years but i watched for a long time and i in my my gut believe that they're no different than they were when i stopped watching so that's that's why i'll kind of speak in the present sometimes and i see the match cards on twitter and everything champions fight each other intercom champion loses what it's whatever you know and the mid card titles there always they started that was the company where like mid mid card titles just meant nothing they were props because that person still wanted a world title i was worried nwa was going that direction cuz james storm just keeps talking about the nwa championship i think there's more of a story to it than that though because i think you know eli drake's playing a role in this i think eli drake wanted to see that title become bank it so he could he could get his hands on it through other methods rather than having to defeat James Storm for it. Because he wasn't even James Storm's tag team partner for this match. So what what was his role in all this? We'll see. Um, Trevor Murdoch, the first match was him versus Josephus. Now, Josephus re- referenced the spiritual advisor and everything. And I've said this on all the other episodes when I'm doing this podcast. I, I want that Josephus with the spiritual advisor character. I don't. I just, he just looks like a regular wrestler here. And then you bring in Trevor Murdoch, who looks like a regular dude. They just look like two regular dudes brawling and fighting. And um, yeah, wrestling back in the days used to have those kind of matches, but no company in their right mind uh, would have a match with those two guys on TV today and give them time. This is not a bad thing. I'm just saying, obviously, NWA is willing to give people different opportunities and not every gimmick works in every company and trevor murdoch is actually perfect for this perfect for nwa uh josephus who was such a big role in all this like building up to this who was in the world title picture and they're doing all this these creative things with him like and he's essentially like a jobber so hopefully they do something better with him and more with him like i just i don't quite get what they're what they're trying to do there, but uh, this was a minute and a half match, so maybe they didn't have confidence put confidence in putting these two guys in the ring very long either. But Trevor Murdoch wins, and they kind of you know he's saying I want an NWA contract, which they haven't really painted the picture that if you're they painted the picture if you're on TV with the exception of the enhancement talents that you're part of the roster. So I don't I, I don't get it, but um, it's nice to see these big brawler guys on TV. Am I a fan of that kind of wrestling? Not really, but it's kind of nice to see it because you have to have something something different. Um, they give it. We got a little bit of the all this not allowing Camille to talk. You know, I'm kind of glad they kind of took a break from that this week. You know, just let it let it breathe a little bit. But the uh, match after this. Um, we get the no D, no DQ, the Dawson's versus Homicide, Eddie Kingston. As I've said, I'm not – the Dawson's don't do a whole lot for me, but obviously NWA feels good about them. And they're getting – they're actually getting pretty legitimate heat from the crowd. This is – you know, I talked about blurring the lines. This has been a pretty clear-cut heel tag team. Even though they may not do a lot for me as a fan, I think what they're trying to achieve with them is working. And they've been – highly featured i mean they're in the first ma- nwa match ever so they've been highly featured in this they took on homicide and eddie kingston now these are my guys this is my team here uh they're the ones i'm really excited to get the opportunity to watch and you know they've done a really good job with all these matches that you know they, yeah they throw some random matches out there but just taking the time to have these little promos between the two at the interview stage and everything it, it, it just helps tell a little bit of a story to make the match actually matter so what they're doing with the tag team division you got you got aw who's like we're gonna put on the best tag team division in the world and it's a bunch of i mean super finishers and sp- you know spots and and i mean <laughs> jesus christ yeah it's entertaining but you look at the tag team division here with what they're doing with NWA. We're not getting that, but we're getting two teams here that aren't in the title picture that are already meaning something to the audience. 
you know, it's like you want your you you want to see Homicide and Kingston get that, you know, legit shot at the title, and then they're building up the Dawsons. So obviously with Wildcard, they're the they're the title holders, so they're they're going to be important. They're going to mean something. But you're already building up a couple teams to matter. So that's nice, and you're doing it through storytelling. You're not doing it by flipping around and you know kicking out of super finishers, you know, and doing a tag team tournament. You're not doing any of that. You're just you're just through storytelling making the teams matter. So the division is getting uh, pretty interesting. Marty Bell gets another match. She wrestled last week. She took on Ashley Vox. Uh, to me, Ashley Vox looks really green. The match in general looks really scripted. So. This wasn't a, you know, my favorite match in the world, but people seem to be very high on Ashley Vox. I know Allison Kay is. We talked about Marty Bell being her best friend, and that's a shoot. Um, so she is very happy to have these two girls over there because I believe she's also really high on Ashley Vox. Marty Bell looked really good last week. This match was a little clunkier. It wasn't clunky. It wasn't clunky. It was It was slow. It was... It was like two dance partners, you know, um, like if you watch Dancing, I watch Dancing with the Stars, okay? When you're watching the rehearsals, the little clips of the rehearsals, and this is what we're going to do, like this, that's what this match was to me. It wasn't the final product. It, it's just like there was a lot of telegraphing and everything. But I still got to say, Marty Bell had that little interview. She, she never cut an interview like that on Impact, you know? She just, she looks way better and carries herself better and wrestles better than she did on Impact. I mean, she's she's improved quite a bit. And I'm really happy to see her on my, my TV screen with power. I really am. And I say on my TV screen because I, I fire it up on my uh, my Roku stick or my Fire Stick or, or whatever. But um, definitely watch, it's def- definitely cool to watch NWA on your TV. So don't just, don't just settle for your... Uh, devices and everything your your phone and your tablets so thunder rosa i've been waiting for this i've been waiting for thunder rosa to show up um i wanted her to end up with impact she had said on twitter one time she wanted to come to impact and i was hoping they were gonna to bring her on but i really like her um she did really good work in and uh lucha underground and i didn't know she was in women of wrestling as the uh oh what the fuck is her character ah it's escaping me, but I was I was thinking like God, that girl's good. I didn't know it was her. I believe it was her. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was her though. But that being said, I do like her, and you know, obviously, probably Impact probably stayed away because similarities to how Rosemary looks. But I really liked when she came down because th- let me tell you why this was impactful was because obviously NWA doesn't play music. There's no theme songs. There's no nothing like that going on. She comes out and I was wondering how they were going to present her character because she's, I don't want to say a supernatural character. She's, she's, she's a little out there for what they're doing with, with NWA and everything. And she, you know, tried to give, almost try to shake hands. I think with Marty Bell, I was really surprised Marty Bell lost this match. Very, I was very shocked. Um, and <laughs> speaking of winners and losers, I realized I talked about the tag team match and even talk about the finish of the match. So I'll get right back to that when I'm done here with, uh, Thunder Rosa, but you know, she came out and they played the drums as she was standing there in the ring. So they gave her an element, to just make her feel a little different and maybe they're building something with her and her and Marty Bell. So we'll see. I, I I do like what they're doing so far with the women's division. And I think Thunder Rosa is an excellent talent to bring aboard. Uh, she just got a good look. She's in good shape. And um, she she was an excellent Brie Bella for Halloween, if you f- follow her on Instagram. So I'm excited to see what happens with her and a women's division. Uh, with the, the tag team match, I started talking about who's strong and who's this and this. The Dawson's win this match. Uh, Kingston and Homicide, who are they baby faces? You know, like they came across as baby faces here, but obviously Wildcard got involved and they don't want to face these guys, quite obviously. Um, 
which is weird because the Dawsons also didn't want to face them. Remember I said that last week, they'll, they'll fight anyone but those two, you know, and then uh seems like Wildcard doesn't want to fight these guys either. So they're making it seem like no one wants it with Kingston and Homicide. But, you know, the Dawsons won with outside interference, but that it's getting uh, really interesting to see what they're doing. So sorry, sorry to go back and forth there. Um, I was so busy talking about creatively with the tag team division that I forgot I had to finish up a match to talk about. So then we get Ricky Starks versus Aaron Stevens. As I said, I didn't like Aaron Stevens' very first promo. I, I'm not into the no contact thing. That, but I mean, I guess that gives me a reason to boo him. If I were in the there in the audience, I'd, I'd boo him. Um, I'm not supposed to like everything they do. He's a heel. And I mentioned um, on last week's podcast that um, they're tapping into the two things that made him successful in WWE: the savior of the masses gimmick, and then the method actor they're tapping into those two things and bringing them together and making him entertaining and making him a big deal they they're not trying to change him like impact did so we're gonna try to make him this top baby face star and take all his charisma away and everything that made him popular up to this point we're just gonna count on his mic skills they said hey we just put give him a mic um he'll make magic but he couldn't as a baby face it was boring so he's in better shape than he was in Impact. He, you know, he's still a little thick, but he, he he's he's in better shape. And he came out the robe and everything. And then Ricky Starks is someone that they're, you know, he it, it reminds me of when you're watching wrestling. Um, I'll say like maybe in the late '80s. Obviously, that's what they're going for here. But <laughs> late '80s, kind of going into early '90s, and you know, I'm referring to. You know, the Coco Bewares, the, the Rockers, uh, young Shane Douglas, um, you know, guys like this were like, oh, the, these high flyers. But really, they were just high flyers because they, you know, did some cross body blocks and drop kicks and um, some arm drags, you know, uh, rolling arm drags and a couple top rope moves. You know what I mean? So he reminds me of that where they're like, is this a young high flyer, which he's not doing anything crazy. But as I've said before, I think he's capable of a lot more than we're seeing for him. Like if we were to see him in the X division or if we were to see him in the cruiserweight division, you know, he'd probably show us a complete different side of him. So I guess what I'm saying is it's kind of a nice throwback to where here's our young up and comer. Um, he's not out there flipping and doing all this crap. He probably can. I, I'm, I would be willing to bet he can, but he's just out there like really just putting on good matches and just fall he falls in line with what they're doing with everybody else he's just younger you know and he he's their legitimate shot at like building a a young star you know like he's someone obviously they see a lot in so he's their um you know their their ec3 whatever he's, he's this guy like okay we're gonna we're gonna craft this guy from zero into something so the, the, it's going to be one of the more interesting things to follow with it, you know, NWA as they as they go on. But he did get the win in this match. He rolled up Stevens. Um, there was a lot of rolls up roll ups. There was, you know, three roll up finishers in this because um, Murdoch won with his bulldog. So there's three roll up finishers, and I thought all of them were they look like they should have been kicked out of. I think the ref count should have been a little quicker. You know you know what I mean? Maybe you got that vibe. This main event, which was Nick Aldis, and he brought out Colt Cabana and Ken Anderson, and they took on James Storm, uh, Royce Isaacs, and Thomas Latimer, well, wild card. So this makes sense because Storm and Latimer are close. Um, one thing with the tag team division, aside from the Dawsons, this is real, one thing that's really different to me I, I, or weird to me. I really expect with the NWA, they were going to bring back like tag teams who dress like each other. You couldn't look any different than Latimer and Isaacs and even, you know, homicide and Kingston, you could easily make them dress similar. <laughs> they And they don't, you know, they do it with the Dawson's and that's it. So that was something with this tag team division. I was expecting the, you know, the Rougeau brothers, the Killer Bees, the Heart Foundation, the British Bulldogs, all this, where they look the same, you know? 
but they, you know, that hasn't happened thus far. But this main event here was by far the most entertained I've been with a. I shouldn't say that I was really entertained with Storm and Nick Aldis, but in a different way because of the story. But from a wrestling standpoint, this was the one I liked the, the most because it had a bunch of guys who who matter and people we know who they are. We're not trying to get you know familiar with them. We know who all these guys are, and especially if you're an Impact fan, you're really happy to see Storm out there with with uh, Latimer. You know. Like two guys we like that we really like, and they do a good job with putting implications on these title matches. I remember when they were they were, you know Nick Aldis was uh, feuding with Josephus and oh my God who was the other one? Oh God I can't remember for the life of me, but they were you know they were cutting a deal they're having a, a three way match, saying hey you know like. One of us win this match. It doesn't matter who it is. You know, instead of just making a three-way match for the title, the two challengers said, hey, let's team up. Let's win this match. Just one of us. Doesn't matter who. And whoever wins, we the other person gets the first title shot. You know? Sometimes you tell just tell these little stories that really matter. I want to say Josephus was trying to... Con- convince Nick Aldis to to uh, join him I think they might have been taken on Tim Storm so um, please correct me because I know I'm 99% wrong, I'm wrong on what that match was so you can let me know in the comments if you're, if you're listening on YouTube but they do a good job of just throwing those little intricacies that make the title matches matter or the main event matter you know um when the when the match was Homicide and Kingston for the Dawson versus the Dawson's like that sort of didn't matter, but with Tim Storm and Aldis and with this like this this matters it matters it matters it matters. So I was really invested who was who was going to win with this. Where's the story going to go? And uh, Cole Cabana got the win over Latimer. And again, you know these these finishes were were too slow in my opinion with 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 the three main matches. So this means uh, James Storm does have to put his title up against Colt Cabana. So they could take in a new direction with this title because I really think Eli Drake is going to involve himself in this in one way, shape, or form. You know, he's he's got something up his sleeve. So I, I really want to see what it is. But overall, this episode of Power was excellent. It's uh, probably my second favorite episode compared to the first one, or or was a tie with last week. Uh, the second one was a clear last place for me, but um, other than that, this was a good episode. It just continues to be easy to watch, easy to digest. You know, the show is over before you know it, and that's that's some of the magic with NWA Power. So, I am your boy BQ. Thank you for checking me out this week, and I'll talk to you next week. Peace. <laughs>